Hello everyone, this is Russ Barkley. I'm a retired clinical professor of psychiatry from various medical centers here in the US, as you know from the introduction to this channel. Uh, this is the first of what I hope will be many research updates that I will bring to you on research that has been published within the past week or two uh, on the internet in various scientific journals. I've posted in the description that goes with this video a list of this week's articles that appeared the week ending uh, May 17th, I believe it was. So uh, I just want to review some of these with you to highlight a few findings and uh, comment on a few others. Uh, first of all, as you can see here, there were a number of papers that appeared last week and uh, some of these were about the overlap of ADHD with borderline personality disorder and how to assess that or at least screen for these disorders uh, using a rating scale that has now been converted into Spanish. So it's an interesting article. It's nice to see more of these screening skills becoming available in languages other than English. But other than that, it's not an especially noteworthy paper. Uh, there is also a paper that appeared based on a dissertation uh, that is questioning the legitimacy of ADHD. Uh, I often find these to be very superficial treatments of the concept of the disorder. Here, the point being made is that because ADHD lies along a dimension or a spectrum of severity that includes some symptoms appearing within the typical population, that because there's no sharp boundary between what is typical and what is neurodevelopmental, uh, then ADHD can't be a legitimate disorder. It, it kind of treats ADHD like pregnancy. It's something that you either have or you don't. And we know that as with most psychological disorders, they're not categorical, they're dimensional. And so we have to impose a somewhat arbitrary dividing line between typical people and ADHD individuals based on the severity of their symptoms. And where we draw that line is where impairment begins. So when does a sufficient number of ADHD symptoms cross the line and become a diagnosis or mental disorder? And the answer to that simply is where harm is occurring to the individual well beyond that that is expected in the typical population. Harm can be increased risk of death or mortality, uh, increased risk of injury as in morbidity, or an increased risk for various medical problems, uh, or it can be impairment in major life activities beyond what we see in typical people. So, all you have to do is meet one of those criteria and your symptoms and their severity are such that we would now give you a diagnosis. So to put it simply, disorders begin where impairment or harm begins. No impairment, no harm, no disorder. It doesn't matter how many symptoms you happen to have. Now, is that somewhat arbitrary? Well, in a sense, yes. Whether we draw the line at the 90th percentile or the 95th percentile doesn't really make much difference. The more important issue here is at what level of severity are most people with that level of symptoms impaired or experiencing harm? And we try to draw that line at a level where the majority of individuals who are symptomatic are impaired. And that's why we give you the diagnosis. Now you might say, well, why is that necessary? It's necessary because many decisions in life are categorical decisions. Whether or not to medicate somebody, whether or not to give them social security disability benefits, whether to grant them entitlements for protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act or special educational services under the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, IDEA, which covers special education. I could go on and on, but there are many times in life where the clinician has to make that decision. And if we refuse to make that decision, if we say that ADHD shouldn't be a label and that there is no legitimacy to this construct, then of course we will fail to get individuals these particular protections, entitlement services, and support. So you can't have it both ways. 
you can't determine that ADHD isn't legitimate and is just part of normal variation. And then at the same time, ask that we provide all of these accommodations and supports to people who fall into this diagnosis. Um, so, you know, that, that's a rather interesting dissertation that was published. Uh, it does raise these other issues that I hear from time to time, but it's important to remember that while ADHD is dementia, that we can diagnose it legitimately where harm begins. And doing so then gives these people access to treatment, care, protection, entitlement that they would not otherwise be entitled to. Now, further down the list of articles, you'll see that there was a paper published uh, further showing the neuroanatomical uh, cortical basis of ADHD within the brain. In this case, it was actually looking inside the brain in the subcortical areas that might be linked up to different presentations of ADHD, the combined presentation versus the inattentive presentation. So it, it's an interesting paper in the sense that it does show that there are structural differences that are associated with each of these presentations. I do want to point out that we no longer subtype ADHD into three types. It's now called a presentation in the DSM-5 Diagnostic Manual. And we've been doing that for the last decade. So if you read an article, say, in the trade media, which I often find that declares that ADHD has three types, that's very outdated. Uh, you, you can tell that the author is over a decade out of date by just making that declaration. So we have three presentations, and they're called presentations because people vary over time in which presentation they might have. They can go from the hyperactive presentation in the preschool years to the combined presentation once they develop enough inattention, symptoms usually by school age, and then by late adolescence to adulthood, the hyperactivity is waning to some extent, and now we might put them in the inattentive presentation. So somebody with the same type of ADHD could go through all three presentations. There's no subtyping. There's nothing that's categorical, definitive, or distinct across these different presentations, other than that some symptoms at this point in time are a little bit more obvious than they were previously or than they are in other people with the disorder. That's really all that it means. There's nothing else there. But this paper does suggest that there are some subtle differences in brain structures that might be related to the different presentations at a particular point in time. Now, I think a more important paper that appeared has to do with the overlap of ADHD with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and you can see that there's a lecture on my YouTube channel that deals exactly with that. Uh, we now know that you can have ASD, autism spectrum, with ADHD, and the DSM diagnostic manual now allows for that overlap. Previously, in earlier versions of the DSM manual, uh, those two were considered mutually exclusive, and we now know that that was a mistake, that many people with ADHD can have ASD and vice versa. This paper happens to show, in screening a sample of ADHD individuals, that about 20 to 30 percent of them met criteria for having some degree of autism spectrum disorder. Usually it's toward the milder or higher functioning end. So it's just one more in a series of papers out there that shows that there is overlap between the two disorders. And as I say in my other lecture on the topic, about <clears throat> 20 to 25 percent or more of people with ADHD may fall on the autism spectrum legitimately. And we find that more than double that rate, 50 to 60 percent or more of people who have ASD are also likely to qualify for a diagnosis of ADHD. So that is what we call comorbidity. Uh, and it just means that the two disorders can coexist and it makes the pr presentation and its management much more complicated. Now, there was also a paper on testing out a program, a psychosocial intervention for helping people with ADHD with their social functioning. Uh, this was particularly so for uh, patients with adult ADHD. <clears throat> and these patients underwent a uh, clinically delivered therapeutic program uh, that focused more on their social relationships 
uh, than is typical of cognitive behavior therapy or other interventions for ADHD. And it did find that the program did seem to be helpful in assisting or improving the social functioning of these individuals. That does not mean that this is a replacement for medication or that it replaces other forms of psychological treatment like cognitive behavior therapy for adult ADHD. It simply says that with future research, we might find that uh, this approach to dealing with social difficulties might also be a helpful treatment for adults with ADHD that are having social problems. So uh, stay tuned. Obviously, this is not a definitive study. It's more of a pilot study that suggests some help might be in the offing for the social aspect of ADHD through this kind of psychological treatment program. <clears throat> There's also a couple of papers that appeared that I'm not going to mention right now, but dealt with various aspects of ADHD in an outpatient setting dealing with uh, the quality of care that they may be getting. Uh, but we don't want to spend much time on that here. If you're interested, you can read about that uh, elsewhere. There was a paper going back to neuroanatomy of ADHD that did suggest that different degrees of thickness of the gray matter, the cortex of the brain, uh, might be related to level of impairment on neuropsychological testing, particularly tests that are measuring executive functioning. That, that's kind of interesting to a researcher. It really doesn't have any clinical significance at this point because the relationships, although they were significant, were not particularly strong or robust. But you know, to a scientist like myself, that might be uh, some curiosity. Uh, and then there is a paper dealing with pathways from ADHD into juvenile delinquency. We've known that ADHD predisposes individuals to uh, conduct problems by adolescence, if not earlier, uh, at least 25%. And in some studies, such as my own longitudinal study, upwards of 40% of individuals with ADHD did go on to develop conduct disorder, which is the official diagnosis for delinquency in the DSM criteria. Uh, and that these individuals are also the ones most likely to progress on into also developing substance use disorders. Uh, and a subset of them may, by adulthood, uh, in addition, qualify for uh, psychopathic personality or antisocial personality disorder. So an interesting paper because it talks about one factor along this pathway might well be the impairment that the individual is experiencing in their social relationships, their interpersonal relationships, uh, and also in how they perceive those relationships. We find that usually people with ADHD and conduct disorder often are blaming other people for the conflict that they're experiencing in those social relationships. And that might be a signal, if you will, or a marker that such an individual is now going down the pathway toward delinquency. So yes, there's a relationship between ADHD and the development of delinquent or conduct disordered behavior. There are many factors along that pathway that appear to be influencing that development, not the least of which is the extent to which parents are supervising the ADHD individual, the extent to which they've been treated in childhood, particularly with medication, uh, the extent to which they are impaired in their academic functioning, the more impairment the greater the likelihood they will start to drift toward delinquent behavior. Uh, and then, of course, the degree to which there might be other antisocial individuals living in the family. So lots of things along the pathway to think about between these two conditions. But clearly, it's just one more paper that uh, cements what is already a well-established relationship between the two disorders. So uh, that's our research review for this week. I hope to be posting more uh, research articles as they are published. So join me on this channel for these weekly research updates. Thank you very much and good day.